All right, here we are. Uh, it is March 11th, and we begin a new book. We are on the sixth book in order of the Old Testament, and that is the book of Joshua. Joshua is Hebrew, uh, Yeshua, and it means Yahweh saves. The God, God saves, God delivers. That is the name of Jesus. Uh, we get the Greek equivalent in uh, Gospels, Jesus, but in Hebrew, his mother, his father would have called him Yeshua. So we begin with the book of Yeshua, and of course, this is a different Joshua, but he is an important character nonetheless. Let me begin by reading the introduction to Joshua from the Wesley Study Bible. Joshua confronts readers with the ambiguities that shape Christian faith and life, at the heart of which is the interplay between divine initiative and human response. God gives Israel the land and fulfillment of promises to its ancestors, directs the nation's steps, and wins victories over opposing forces. For God's people, for their part, success to the extent that they maintain devotion to God Heed divine commands and press on in carrying God's mandate to completion. The interaction of these themes in pursuit of the promised rest has led many to read Joshua as an encouragement to endurance in the Christian life and in the Wesleyan tradition to full salvation. Israel's uneven success in occupying the land raises a tension between reality and the ideal. Affirmations of the Lord's faithfulness and power express an ideal that aligns the reader with God's perspective, provides an orientation, and establishes a goal that can be reached with God's help. The book's warning, warnings against abandoning the faith and obedience, divisions among the people, and reports of land not taken, however, set this ideal against the realities of human failure and frailty and wavering. Another tension involves the complexities of honoring and discerning God's priorities. Frequent warnings to obey the commands of Moses emphasize the crucial importance of living within the boundaries that define God's people. Those boundaries are flexible, however, in the stories of Rahab, Achan, and the Gibeonites, since they somehow seem to withdraw the ethnic boundaries that separate Israel from the nations and invite reflection on whether God's purposes are better reflected by massacres or mercy. In the book's climactic scene, Joshua defines Israel as a people constituted by choosing the God who has chosen them. In this way, he establishes boundaries for the community of God's people that are even more expansive than those that define their land. So as we begin the book of Joshua, the first section of chapter one, let me say before I get into that, that broadly Joshua is divided into three sections. The first 12 chapters highlight Israel's victory against the Canaanites as they enter into the promised land. Uh, the second major section is chapters 13 through 21, which consists of the allotments to the 12 tribes of the land is parceled out. And then uh, the third section, which is just chapters 22 through 24, uh, concerns the proper worship of God. So that's, that's Joshua broadly. So we begin in the first nine verses is transition, transition from the book of Deuteronomy into the book of Joshua. And so again, we are reminded of Moses's death, and God now comes to Joshua, just as God had come to Moses so many times before, to speak to Joshua, because Joshua is indeed Moses's legitimate successor. And so God reminds Joshua of the promise and what is going to happen in giving uh, his people possession of this land. And uh, there is encouragement here for Joshua, be strong be courageous, and don't forget to act in accordance with all the law that my Moses, that my servant Moses commanded. So in a sense, be like Moses, Joshua says, or God says to Joshua. And so uh, stay on that. And in verse eight, 
uh, a verse that I memorized many years ago as a young man, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart from you, but you shall meditate upon it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it, for then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall be successful. The law remains central, the word of God that's been given. And it's critical not only that Joshua as the leader of Israel follows it, but that the people of Israel follow the law as well. So you get the, the reminder, you, uh, you get the reminder, the promise, and the reminder of the promise, and then the encouragement. And now you get preparations for the invasion. And uh, one of the things that you get in the rest of chapter one is a reminder. Remember when uh, the Israelites back there in Deuteronomy are getting ready to cross into the promised land, and the Reubenites, uh, the Gadites, and half of the Manassehites of the three tribes wanted land east of the Jordan. Uh, not in the promised land, but east of the Jordan, and God gave them the land, but the requirement was that when time came to invade Canaan, that their able-bodied men would join them in battle. So they are reminded by this. Uh, Joshua reminds them of their word, and they affirm. They say in verse 16, they answer Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so will we obey you. Now, there's two things to note here. First is they recognize Joshua as the legitimate successor of Moses, and this is important. So Mo Joshua is not seen as somehow a second-class leader or a counterfeit leader. He is viewed as the leader, and the people pledge their allegiance to his leadership, uh, and so we will obey you just as we obeyed Moses. But they also say we will obey you as we obeyed Moses in all things. In all things. Now, we've read through this. Yeah, the people obeyed Moses in all things. No, well, they didn't, did they? Um, and they didn't obey Moses and they didn't obey God. But, you know, we like to, oh, I don't know, maybe we like to have an idealistic memory about the things better than they are. But anyway, they make a pledge to obey Joshua's words. So when we get into chapter two, we get spies go to Jericho. Now this is interesting because the spies go into Jericho to, to sort of scope out the land. Remember we had spies went in uh, earlier in Deuteronomy before they were in the land, but now uh, particularly Joshua wants to know about Jericho. And um, they enter into Jericho. Jericho, like every major city in that day was fortified, had a wall. Uh, around it to protect, and those gates were closed usually at night to keep out the wrong people and also made it difficult for enemies to sneak in at night. So the, the two men during the daytime get into Jericho, and uh, apparently that there are people from Jericho that know they've come and know about the Israelites who are about to come into the land, so they want to find these spies. So uh, the uh, two spies uh, among the Israelites are hidden by a woman. Rahab, her name is her name, and we're told she's a prostitute, and she hides them, and uh, she waits till the gates close at dark, and uh, she uh, lives in the wall. So you have to picture this big, thick outer wall. Oh, my gosh, that could be six, eight, ten feet thick. Uh, and a formidable wall for sure if you're going to attack it. But then within that wall, uh, homesteads were built, apartments, we can call, let's call them apartments were built so that uh, there were people who actually lived in houses right attached to the wall itself. Rahab lives there and she's got a window that uh, faces the outside. And so she's uh, ready to let the spies down at night so they can return safely. But Rahab wants a promise. We know you're coming. And we've heard stories about your God delivering you from Egypt and passing you through the waters of the Red Sea. And frankly, we're all scared to death. And so please, when you come into this city and take it, please spare me and my family. And so the spies make a deal with her that they will do that uh, as long as she doesn't give them up, as long as she doesn't uh, uh, give away their secret of being there and what they've discovered. 
and they're told, uh, they tell Rahab uh, to put a crimson cord in her window. So when that they attack the city, uh, they will know where she and her family is. Put your family in with you in the same apartment there. Put your family in with you and we will make sure to spare you when we come, but make sure that crimson cord is in the window so we know. It's sort of a reminder of the blood on the doorpost, right? The Passover lamb, you put the blood on the doorpost and the Passover lamb or the lamb or the angel of death passes by. And so here, as the people come into Jericho, uh, they will pass, the army will pass by this apartment uh, because of the crimson cord that is in the window. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that Rahab represents the kind of person who is a threat to the loyalty of the covenant and the people of Israel. She is a prostitute. Um, we've had clear uh, prohibitions about certain sexual activity, and prostitution is often connected to cultic activity. Uh, fertility deities and other things. And so she actually represents the kind of person who is a threat, but here she is spared. So it's interesting to ask this question and say, do we have here a glimpse of what God's ultimately bigger project is? And that is to offer deliverance to the world, uh, eventually for Christians in Jesus Christ. And Rahab is a glimpse of that. Rahab, uh, the prostitute, is a glimpse of what is to come, a God who saves the world and shows mercy to all. Could that be? Is it possible? Rahab will figure into Jesus's genealogy when we get to the Gospels. So stay tuned, more on Rahab. Well, the spies return with uh, uh, the news uh, and things look pretty good for the invasion. And so now Israel crosses the Jordan. And again, we have some reminiscence of the crossing of the Red Sea. The priests are to carry the ark in the middle of the Jordan and when the, in the river, a certain spot. And when they uh, cross into the Jordan, uh, it stops where they are. And so the, the people can cross, the army can cross on dry land. The Ark of the Covenant leads the army because it is a reminder that this is God's battle, that this is God who is doing this, and that it's a reminder that God is the one who will sustain them and, and bring the victory. And they stay in the river until everyone has passed over on the other side, and then uh, the priests walk with the Ark, and as soon as they cross onto dry land, the river starts to flow freely again, and uh it's quite the sight. And uh, we get uh, a monument set up here at this place at Gilgal, as it's called, it really Gilgal. Gil Gilgal means circle. And we really don't quite know where it is uh, and exactly where the uh, Israelites crossed the Jordan River. But they are to set up 12 stones uh, in memory and remembrance of what happened there and the 12 tribes that crossed. And we get an editorial comment in chapter 4, verse 9. Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. So this is a later editorial comment. Sure sounds like it. It sounds like a later editor who's working with this material and who puts a little insert in there to explain something to later hearers. By the way, there is that monument that's still there. You can go and see it if you haven't already. So kind of interesting how a reminder that there were later, later uh, uh, fingers at work in transmitting this material. So anyway, uh, so the priests come on shore. And uh, we're told that as Israel crosses on verse 14, on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. Um, I, you know, uh, leadership is not only, not only challenging on a day-to-day -day basis, but leadership can be difficult, particularly if you're the person following the leader everyone adores and everyone loves, you know? So here the people have had Moses for all of these years. What a faithful leader he has been. 
uh, faithful to God. He, he related to God as an old friend, the text tells us. And, and the respect that he had in the eyes of the people and the couple of times that there were people complaining, that didn't last too long. But, you know, Moses is just Moses, right? He's, he's, he's I mean, who is going to succeed Moses of all people? And so Joshua coming into that really has, has his uh, work cut out for them in that no doubt, uh, you know, we human beings, we compare, don't we? We compare, we contrast, and probably doesn't take too long for you got a few people who, you know, Joshua is not like Moses. Who's going to fill Moses' shoes? Joshua is not like Moses. He's different. And so it, it had to be a difficult position uh, for Joshua to step into. And, and so uh, God is able, and part of it is because Joshua is willing to be faithful to God, to be sure, but the Lord is able to, through all of this, exalt Joshua, where Joshua himself gains respect in the eyes of the people, and they are willing to follow him, just as they're following Moses. Um, and a reminder to all of us that we are all different, and God calls all of us, and uh, we're not all the same, and we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to others or others to others, because that's not the way this should work, and uh, we should accept people for their gifts and what they have and what they're able to offer, understand that they're going to have limitations, every human being does, and so uh, uh, whether it's Moses or whether it's Joshua, uh, we follow their lead because God has called them. So anyway, uh, just some thoughts on leadership. By the way, these first four chapters, particularly chapter one, is often used uh, in presentations of leadership, uh, according to the scripture, because you get chapter one and you get this where, where it really is about what to do, what good leaders do and how good leaders lead. And so it's not an accident that some of this material has found its way into uh, books on Christian leadership. So Israel crosses over the Jordan on dry ground um, and uh, just like the Red Sea. And this sort of marks a closing. So just as Israel begins its journey in the wilderness by crossing the waters of the Red Sea, so they now end their wilderness journey by crossing the waters of the Jordan River. Sort of two bookends uh, on a section of their history. And now a new history emerges. A new history opens of crossing into Canaan, the promised land, in order to claim that land that God has given. And... Uh, so, so we, we have a, a, new, uh, a, a new era that begins, and, but it's not going to be a perfect era, uh, and it's going to be beset with some problems, and we will deal with those uh, as time goes on. So let's, uh, tomorrow we would do four more chapters, five, six, seven, and eight, uh, and you're going to have a new generation, and a little more about some Passover at Gilgal that's celebrated and Joshua, his vision and um, has a vision and Jericho is finally is taken, the first city to fall. Joshua did the battle of Jericho, right? As we, as we sing uh, and we're gonna, but we're gonna have some problems. We're gonna have uh, sin. Uh, a guy named Achan is going to uh, uh, throw a wrench into the works and uh, we're going to finish in chapter eight tomorrow with the city of I, which will be captured. And then once again, we end chapter eight with what have we seen several times before? A covenant renewal, right? Renew the covenant. Be reminded. God loves you. God has made a way for you. God keeps his promises. You keep yours and you be faithful. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this wonderful day. And we just ask that, uh, that indeed we will meditate upon your law, that we will meditate upon it and that we will follow it, not turning to the right or to the left, uh, so that indeed in all of our ways, we may faithfully reflect your will. So be with us in this day as we continue to journey as followers of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, folks. Hasta mañana. <laughs>